It was like a vampire. He came in and sucked the life out of us. The Obama campaign continues attacking Mitt Romney's role at Bain Capital. We view Mitt Romney as a job destroyer. Angering many on Wall Street. I, I would call myself a barely Democrat at this point. Wake up, America, look what's going on. We catch up with Mr. Romney's biggest fan and answer your questions on the high-profile Senate race in Massachusetts. I'm Megan Lieberman for The New York Times, and I am joined now by Catherine Rampell to talk about the president's continuing challenges with Wall Street donors. Uh, Catherine, our colleague, uh, Nick Confessori, has a piece today right. about how the president risks further alienating Wall Street with these attacks on Bain Capital. But as someone who talks to people on Wall Street all the time, I imagine that they've been feeling alienated for quite some time now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically since Obama got elected, um, there's been a lot of bank bashing, as you can imagine, amongst the overall populace and amongst politicians, uh, Obama included. Um, there's Dodd-Frank. There's a lot of sort of whining about what that will actually be, even though we don't actually know what it'll look right. like. But there's a lot of concern on Wall Street that they feel somewhat betrayed after having um, uh, really supported up a lot. Right, exactly. Right. right. And he, he, I think he's quite aware that he's not going to get the donor support from Wall Street that he got last time. Um, there's been a lot of complaint from Wall Street about the tone that he's taken with them um, and in the public about them, that he's unfairly or unnecessarily, in their view, vilified them for the financial crisis and social inequality. Even and though, of course, you know, he has been supportive of various bailouts and, right. and that sort of thing for this sector. Um, right. So, you know, you can sort of read it from both sides, right? So if right. you're on Wall Street, you're thinking, well, why isn't he being nicer to us? If you're not on Wall Street and you're, in, you know, amongst the Occupy Wall Streeters, you'll think, why is he being so, so nice, nice to, to them? them. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, there is a question about how much of this is is about the tone, how much of this is really about policy. I think, you know, from the outside, there is the view of that you could say he did a lot to help financial institutions, particularly when he first got into office. He propped them up, mm -hmm. and in fact, that even the regulations. As a Democratic president coming in this kind of financial crisis, he could have gone a lot farther and been more aggressive about that. I, I assume that's yeah, not. Yeah, but, but that's not how the bankers are thinking <laughs> really? about it, right? I'm, I'm they're, they're not saying, yeah. oh, could have been, been worse. So much worse. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's not the attitude. It's why isn't he being nicer to us? We gave him a lot of money in 2008. Um, you know, we are, we are crucial to the function of the economy. Is he anti business? Is he just. Is he is he actually anti-business? Is he pandering to his his uh, constituents or potential? Is it class constituents? warfare? Is it class warfare? Right. And then uh, Nick's story today, of course, talks about the the latest spate of ads attacking private equity in particular, um, which is how we started talking about right. this. Um, the idea that uh, Obama has been talking about or ha has a has a bunch of ads criticizing Mitt Romney as being unqualified for the presidency because of his experience within private equity. Right. And, and he's trying to sort of split the baby here a little bit. He's trying to say, uh, it's not that I'm against Wall Street, it's not that I'm against business, it's not that I'm against private equity, it's just not a good qualification for being president. That's not what a president does. You don't try Which to- Which is still not exactly a compliment to the private equity Indeed. folks who are raising <laughs> money for him, so they're or, not terribly- Or raising less money for or him. Or raising they, less yeah. money for him, right. Um, one of the things that people have thought is that perhaps uh, one of the things they're also unhappy about on Wall Street is not just the public tone, but some of the, the private tone, which is that the president's known for being somewhat hesitant, if not hostile, to the kind of donor maintenance courting of. Yeah, he's, he's not as much. He's not known for being as much of a schmoozer as Bill Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton was, or, or, or even Chuck Schumer, or some yeah. of the other politicians in New York. I mean, or even George W. Bush, you know, right. who the, the guy everyone wanted to have a beer with, right? Um, Obama. He, he made a name for himself in 2008 for raising a lot of money from these little donors um, that didn't require the same kind of right. donor maintenance. That if you're if you're a big donor, you're used to being sucked up to a little bit. Um, you're probably expecting more attentiveness from right. the president. A certain assiduous courting that you've right. gotten used to in the rest of your life. Um, there's also the question of whether the president is suffering from the fact that Mitt Romney is not the kind of Republican as some other recent Republican leaders have been who alienates Wall Street on cultural and social levels in the right. same way. He's not just a business guy and sort of one of them in that way, but you can imagine if it were Rick Santorum as the nominee or Newt, Newt Gingrich, Gingrich as the right. nominee, right, that they would just not be as culturally comfortable or identifying with him as they are with Mitt Romney. And that's another thing that the president has to fight with Wall Street. Here. Right. I, well, I remember during the primaries talking with uh, some sources who work in finance. Um, who were talking about how conflicted they would feel about the election if they had to vote for they had to vote <laughs> for someone who didn't believe in evolution, 
right? I mean, <laughs> right. It, it, this, was a, this was a big question. Do they vote with their wallets? Do they vote with, with their conscience? With their conscience or whatever. Um, and obviously with Mitt Romney, who hasn't taken quite as hard a line on social issues, or at least that's not the focus. I mean, he's certainly talked about it, you know. And has, but that's not the perception. That's not the perception. Um, that he's really more of a, of a fiscally focused guy um, and is not going to be making um, religion as much of an, I mean, well, he has certain liabilities <laughs> there as well, of course, right. um, amongst the religious right. Um, but he's not going to be making that as much of an issue as might a Santorum, for example. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. On the campaign trail, Mitt Romney is not exactly known for his rabid fans, but Michael Barbaro caught up with one in Virginia. Since his earliest days on the campaign trail in Iowa, Mitt Romney's events have included at least one constant, a colorful, sometimes bombastic businessman named Jim Wilson and his GMC pickup truck festooned with 27 different Romney for President posters. They love the tacky truck. And, uh, you know, I park it obnoxiously. Uh, it serves a purpose. It marks the location of the event. It hauls stuff that we need at events. Do you have any stickers for I do, me? Freckles. Let's go get them. <laughs> Good. We love them. I love you. Thank you. You know, it enables me to take a poll on the interstates of America. Either get a thumbs up or a third digit. Mr. Wilson's not an official staff member, but he's always helping out. He directs traffic, posts signs, does whatever else needs doing. He says his main obligation is to make everyone feel at home. <laughs> and you brought your ugly brother. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> How are you? Anyway, the events down there. Nice to meet you. And girls have germs. Hey, anyway, <laughs> you made my day. Mr. Wilson retired from selling life insurance, but for the past year, he's trailed Mr. Romney full time. He's logged about 40,000 miles, covering 15 states throughout the course of the primary season. In retrospect, I probably should have been doing political work my whole life. Uh, not only do I like it, but it is important. Hokey, yes, but important. Nice tie. Okay, thanks. I lie a lot, Frank. Even now, Barack Obama has his adoring fans. Mr. Romney, on the other hand, has had more trouble finding that level of passion. For Mr. Wilson, though, passion is never in short supply. Many times I just want to jump up on top of the truck and say, wake up, America, look what's going on. Throughout his life, Mr. Wilson has dabbled in politics, mostly at the state level of Virginia. Yeah. But he says Mr. Romney will be his biggest and his last candidate. After this year, he's heading home to his farm for good. I don't want to, and I'm pushing it this time, I don't want to be one of those old guys that hang on that can't pull their weight. This is my last one, and I'm going to reach down in the bucket for everything I've got for one more bit of energy, and I sure want to go out of the game with a win. I'm joined now by Catherine Seeley to talk about the Massachusetts Senate race. So, Kit, this uh, race for Ted Kennedy's old seat in Massachusetts is probably getting more attention and more money nationally from, than any other race in the country, and we have two like very high profile charismatic candidates, Scott Brown and Elizabeth Warren, and it's looking like it's going to be a very tight election so far. I think it will be. Uh, the polls have pretty much been neck and neck all along. Uh, and there was a new poll last night, right? New poll uh, out last night uh, shows them 48, 47, uh, within, totally within the margin of error. Um, it's, this race has really gotten a lot of attention because they it took, is Ted Kennedy's because, seat. <laughs> because the Republicans took Ted Kennedy's seat in a special election. Democrats are hoping that because this is a presidential year and Massachusetts that that. obviously will be going hugely Democratic that they can win that seat back. Right. Now, Elizabeth Warren is a candidate that a lot of Democrats have been very excited about. She's a national figure, but she's never run before. And she's spent the last month embroiled in this very difficult to explain controversy <laughs> right. about her ethnic heritage and whether she misrepresented herself as being Native American or part Native American, when we don't even really know whether she is part Native American, right? She says she is. This is part of her family lore. And a lot of people have families where there's something murky in the past, but this has been passed down as who you are, where you're from, right. who did what. And she's been unable to escape this for the last month, so we actually took some reader 
comments and questions about this this morning. And so I'm going to start with uh, Tristan from Massachusetts, who says, as a resident of Western Massachusetts, I can report that I've heard no one talk about this. It's a diversion from the issues. I know you were just in Western Massachusetts. <laughs> Indeed, um, I was. Is that what you were hearing from people? Uh, yeah, I must have talked to uh, several Tristans because, <laughs> because maybe Tristan himself. <laughs> no. Right. Um, they all said the same thing. Uh, you know, I'm worried about the price of gas. I'm worried about food going up. I'm worried about my college loans. Uh, and these the fact are the that this things. Is in the paper every day is just not bothering them. Well. I don't know that they're really paying attention. Sure. Uh, it, it's in the Herald every day in Boston. Um, Western Mass, in, in the areas where I was, were largely Democratic. I think people were sympathetic. One woman I talked to actually is part Apache herself. And uh, I, I ran into a guy who was, whose parents were Pakistani and Chinese, and he's black. So thinking, what's this, these what's sort the big of issue here? exactly, and I think that's kind of it is a complex issue, and I think the uh, the Brown campaign is trying to hone this in on being a question of credibility and deception potentially. Um, question number two is from Ben from Massachusetts, who says Scott Brown posed mostly naked in Cosmopolitan in 1982. People do dumb things when it comes to political ability. Do those things make a difference? Well. The obvious answer is it depends. It depends, it right. depends what they did, how long ago and they did it. depends how they respond to it. How right? they respond to it, uh, whether they hurt someone else. Um, I think one question uh, people might be thinking about is like Mitt Romney bullying a kid in high school. That seems to go to character in a, in a very direct way, although it's kind of out of character from what we know about Romney. So I would say when when you do a dumb thing, you know, can you, how do you respond to it? I think right. Scott Brown in the Cosmo But he's case, had a response for that. He has from, a response for right. it, and he kind of laughs about it. And he, and, but he also says, I did this to pay for college. And right. it kind of steps on Elizabeth Warren's message, which is, I'm the consumer advocate. I'm the one who right. uh, is advocating for uh, people to be able to afford college. And, and here he's saying, and I paid sort of struggled, for though, to respond to this. It seems like... This came up at the end of April, and we're now at the end of May, and she still has not come up with an answer or rationale or any way to put this to bed, which seems somewhat surprising. Even Democrats are critical of her campaign and saying they need to get out there, have a, do it in some format, whether it's a full-blown press conference with everyone around or whether it's a sit-down with the New York Times or somebody else, <laughs> uh, you know, to really fully forthrightly and put it to bed and put it to bed because otherwise I mean what this poll showed is people don't really care about it the yet. interesting th yet the interesting thing is this is the kind of thing that can resurface right our last question is from Aria from New York who said if she in fact did fabricate her heritage what harm did it do and to whom that's a really good question and it's hard to prove a negative I think in this case uh, the Brown campaign would like to suggest that maybe there's some white guy out there who didn't get a job hired, that she got. didn't get didn't get a job that she got. There's absolutely no proof of that, and there's no indication that. In fact, the law schools that hired her have emphatically said we didn't even know about her ancestry, or it wasn't a factor. It. We don't care about it. So, what harm did it did did it do? I think. I think what the Brown campaign would like to get across is that they, get, they, use, they can use the word affirmative action, which is a hot button word for a lot of people, particularly the blue collar Reagan Democrats who are in the middle, who are the voters up for grabs. And the ones if, who are going to decide this election. And the right? one who, ones who will decide the election. And if they can get that across, then That's maybe they record. swing some key votes. Thanks, Kit. Thank you. Before we go, a look at another high-profile race. This one's in Wisconsin. Last year, Wisconsin's Republican Governor Scott Walker gained national attention by stripping collective bargaining rights from public workers. Hey, folks, just want to say hello. I'm happy to be running for governor. In two weeks, he faces Milwaukee's Democratic Mayor Tom Barrett in a recall election. Well, I'm here today to tell you that I will never, I will never be the rock star of the far right. And I'll never be the rock star of the far left. But what I want to be is as governor, I want to be rock solid in working to create jobs in this state. You know, the elimination of the collective bargaining, um, you know, was really 
gotten people, um, you know, really to pay closer attention, I think, to what goes on in politics. I think a lot of people think that, you know, what happens down in Madison doesn't affect them. The race will be a rematch between the two men. In 2010, Mr. Walker won by five percentage points. There's too much polarization going on in this country already. So, so I would like to see moderates come out a little better. I think the recall is going to be a, a close vote. You know, definitely a lot of conflicting opinions. Um, a lot of people, you know, that have stood behind Walker and a lot of people who have, you know, really been very vocal, you know, for promoting the recall. They had tables set up downtown, you know, asking for recall signatures for, gosh, I think it was a couple weeks, you know, and, and posters around. So, you know, it, it's, that's why it's really difficult to say which way which way the recall election is going to go. That's all for today. Stay with us online for more on Campaign 2012. I'm Megan Lieberman. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.